good morning. <laughs> was any of that accurate? Come on. No, no. <laughs> Come on. Dad comes down and regulates. Uh, he, he's down here. Um, it's, it's Easter break for the littles this week. And so as you could probably imagine, that's pretty tough to be working and packing and leaving. And so, uh, yeah, dad's helping, uh, with the little, but sometimes I feel like it's just like having a second child. (laughs) Well, you say tomato, uh, last night, (laughs) last night, Katie, the, uh, Sacramento Kings did something I didn't expect them to do. Of course, that was before Kawhi Leonard said he was out, but I don't think Kawhi, uh, not playing should take anything away from this game. They still had Paul George. They still had James Harden. This still was a very tough matchup and the Kings showed up and, uh, quite frankly, Katie, for someone who often, uh, sees the sky falling a little bit and I still kind of do in some aspects, but I was very proud of this team last night, Katie. They were fantastic. I mean, I thought, honestly, I thought the bench came in and were like the difference makers in that game. And especially during that stretch where, you know, there was that, that run that they went on. I thought, I think a lot of it, it, the first quarter was just, Oh, it was Mm -hmm. ugly. It was brutal. Neither team could hit a, hit a basket and, you know, turning the ball over left and right, both sides. And then, you know, I thought the bench immediately came in and stabilized things. And that's when they were able to, to kind of turn the pages and, and go on a run. Also, Jason, sorry, I do have to mention this because you, you said that. It, can we stop with the whole talking about the Kings winning the game? I think they were up like 16 with 342 left. I might have that wrong. And you, I think you said so, you caught yourself because you were like, the game's not over yet, but the Kings win tonight is going to mean that did it, did it. Man, I was so worried if for some reason there was a comeback that announcer Jinx was going to get hung <laughs> around your neck. Just, you know, you got to watch out for that, Katie. What you say matters. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, you never know what's going to happen in the NBA. Three, four minutes is, is kind of a long time, and it can someone can go on a little mini run, and yeah. it can kind of you know make everyone tighten up. And you just got to be careful. <laughs> yeah, um, Katie, you talked about how great the bench was. I, I I was so impressed by them, really, for two games now too. And it's something they have to do, but to actually do it is different. Like. We know Keegan has to be more aggressive. He's doing it. We know Davion can't just be a defender. He's doing it. Alex Lynn's impact. Trey Lyles comes right back and just really has elevated his game. I don't know if it's innately or they were told to, but I think those guys that were kind of just fit in guys are now knowing they've got to do a lot more with Herter and Malik Monk, and they're getting it. How different is that to kind of adjust your role this late in the season, knowing that this team obviously needs all of these guys to be good? Well, I think they clearly understand the assignment, right? Um, I don't. I don't think you know they're all professionals. I don't think they need to be told. Obviously, there are conversations being had in terms of, hey, this is you know what we need from you. I, I you know, I've talked about it before over the last couple of weeks, and really credited Mike Brown because I feel like for some time now, really post All Star break, he's gotten great production from from kind of the ancillary guys on the, on the bench, right? The Davion Mitchell, Chris Duarte, like Kessler coming in and, and doing a great job as well. And these are guys that they went through long stretches of, you know, registering DNPs, you know, and, and not really being a part of the fold. And then Mike doesn't really make a decision like that and just say, Hey, this is who we're writing with. And that's, that right he he'll always bring guys back in give them another opportunity and when he's done that you know kind of midway point of the season with Chris with Davion um he he's gotten great production out of them and they've gotten a little bit of confidence and then when you have an injury guys aren't coming in and you know being completely cold not having touched the floor not having contributed and I think that you know, from a confidence standpoint and perspective, it really, really has saved them over this stretch where now you're starting to be just hammered with injuries. And I give him so much credit for that. And now Sasha's back and, and he's, you know, getting the chance to kind of work himself back in and Trey's stepped back and like, like no time has passed. And I, I honestly think that the time that Trey was off was probably a good thing for him because he was shooting the ball really poorly prior to his injury. And he'd had a stretch of games where, man, the three ball just was not falling for him. And that's a really big part of his role, right? To be able to come in and knock down those open threes, kind of be a stretch guy. 
Um, and so I think that, you know, when you, from a mental standpoint, when you have that time off and you kind of forget, Hey, I've been struggling shooting the ball. He stepped back in, he looks good. He's shooting the ball with confidence. And so I honestly, you guys, I, I truly do credit the coaching staff and Mike Brown for the approach that they take with guys that kind of, you know, can be those deeper bench guys and it's, it's paying off right now. Katie joining us, Katie, we have uh, coined a new phrase here. Uh, term, I should say, an award, you know, much like the Wolody, uh, much like our work on the Sabonis chant, we are now introducing uh, the Velvet King. And what that is, is Malik in Arabic, not sure if you know this, <laughs> means king. And um, Red Velvet is Red Velvet. So that's Malik Monk and Kevin Herter. So every night, we're going to award after a win the award for whichever player stepped up to help fill the void of missing Kevin Herter and, of course, Malik Monk. So we're calling that calling it the Velvet King. The Velvet King, half red. Well, well, Katie, the original thing I wrote yeah, down this was, a work in progress. was Malevin Hertunk, which is a combo of their names, but that just doesn't, it doesn't really flow, does no. it? No. So Jason, who is great at trademarks uh, and, and messaging, uh, he came up with the Velvet King. I love that idea. So last night, who was your Velvet King? And feel free to use that on the uh, TV, by <laughs> Katie's kings of the game. Yeah. yeah. Um, who was my my velvet king? I pr- I would probably I would probably say in this stand, instance, um, Davion. Mm-hmm. Same as you. Yeah. That's... I mean, he he was the one that immediately came in and started talking shots down and defensively. Like, how great is it when you know? I think it was James Harden that tried to post him up mm-hmm. in like the center of the key and. He had him down there pretty deep in the paint. And, um, yeah, no one came to help because it's it's a luxury with Davion. He might be, quote, unquote, undersized, but he is so strong and so physical and such a great defender and, and kind of knows how to, you know, take care of different situations from a defensive standpoint. And he had Davion practically under the basket and not a single person came to help, which is awesome that you can have that, right? And they got the stop. You know, he forced the miss, and that way you don't have James Harden, who is a fantastic passer, being able to dump off to somebody right under the rim because someone had to come and help. So, yeah, I think Davion, from a defensive standpoint, and then the fact that he came in and immediately started knocking down shots when the team just, it looked brutal for a while offensively, and it it turned the table. Yeah. Katie, amongst the many things, you know, speaking of Herter and Monk, obviously you're, you're missing the the stretching of the defense, the shooting that Kevin Herter can provide. Malik, I mean, I think it was playmaking first, but all those highlights. But to me, it, there's there's such an energy, a positive energy to Malik Monk. That That's a tough one to replace. How does this group kind of, I guess when you win, it's there, but how do they kind of do that when there's some days where Malik can just get them out of uh, kind of a little struggle time? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question, Jason, because his energy, I think, is probably the most important thing that he offers. He's a great scorer. He's a great passer, like you said, but he has a certain energy and demeanor on the floor, which I think is contagious for this team. And, you know, he comes in and you can you can feel it. It's, it's palpable. And so, uh, you know, I think having him on the bench is great. You know, he I, I think it still kind of has that impact, kind of like Mason Jones is one of those guys that he may not step on the floor, but I feel like he's always contributing on the sideline, which is important. And I mentioned it on air the other day, like Mason kind of reminds me a little bit of kind of Frank. Uh, Frank Mason and the Liddy committee and, uh, you know, Harry Giles back in the day where they used to do the dance before the game started on the bench and, and all that, like creating that type of energy from the bench, it really does, it does flow onto the floor. And so even though Malik isn't playing right now, like he's out there, <laughs> you know, chest bumping, you know, uh, Keegan after his dunks and, you know, doing his dunk ratings and he was, you know, given Russell Westbrook the thumb down after he missed, <laughs> missed the dunk. And, you know, it's still there, but yeah, I think that it's, it's one of those things that's like, wow, it's, you're going to have to be able to create that every game. And who is it going to be? I don't think it's going to be the same guy every time. 
Katie Christensen joining us. Katie, can I ask you a couple quick coaching questions? Is that okay? No, I, I don't do coaching questions. Yeah, well, I think you'll do these ones. Uh, <laughs> let's start with uh, let's start with the G League. Lindsay Harding, you know her, uh, she, Coach of the Year. I said this earlier uh, when Jason and I were talking about it. I don't want to rain on the parade, but I've been told by many people that girls can't coach boys. I've been told that. <laughs> I read it on. I read it online. I read that they mm-hmm. wouldn't respond. But last I checked, G League players are grown men. Uh, G League players are either, well, they're pros, but former, future NBA players. Uh, And uh, there's a gender difference between the coach and the players, yet she's the G League coach of the year. So tell me how that works out if I read on Twitter from John Smith 6969 (laughs) that women can't coach the men's game. Yeah, it's, um, I think we're past that. I mean, the people that still believe that probably, you know, have had their heads buried in a book somewhere or under a rock. Who knows what's going on with that? But the great thing about Lindsay is I cannot, I cannot tell you how impressive it is what she's done with that team this year because she, in her first year head coaching, has dealt with something, you know, from a, from an off the court standpoint that, coaches at every level might never ever deal with in their entire career and it happened right out of the gate you know and you know that is a tough tough thing to deal with and they struggled kind of at the start um if memory serves correctly they didn't do all that well at the d-league showcase but she has got those guys playing at such a high high level and her personal playing resume is wildly impressive like She was such a fantastic player, both in college, but as a professional. And I think we're past the point, um, certainly within the, the, you know, sidelines of a NBA basketball court. These guys respect WNBA players and they respect the game that they play. And so when it comes from that standpoint, like when your coach can literally show you exactly what she wants you to do defensively and step out there on the floor and she can D you up and she knows the lingo. She has the respect. Like, I think that that t- carries you such a long way. It's not like someone walked off the, you know, you look back in the day, there's plenty of coaches that have coached in this, this game, whether, you know, college or, you know, um, professionally that are men that have never played the game at a high level, but yet they have the respect of players and they listen to them. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, I think that, you know, the people that are kind of in the deep bowels of the Internet can just continue with their conspiracy theories. And then everyone else can just, you know, congratulate her for a really an amazing job. Yeah. And it kind of to follow up on that, Katie, from your days when you played, the WNBA was, you know, still a, a newer league now where it is compared to uh, what like people like Lindsay are doing you working in the NBA, uh, Caitlin Clark and the Dave and I were just talking about the ratings, just setting massive rating numbers as a former high school, college and professional basketball player to see where the women's game is now. I just wonder what you, how you feel about that um, compared to where, where it was when you were playing. Okay. I'm going to kind of, leave the part out where you called me old. <laughs> <laughs> I never yeah, said that. that. Experienced. <laughs> so, that's when the ball was square. M- mature. Were um, <laughs> um, it, on a, it's, a, it's, it's a great point because the game has advanced so, so, so much since I played. You know, my last year in the WNBA was 2006. And that's nearly 20 years ago. And the players that have come through and the fact that this league is so competitive and and has so many eyes on it and the players have just continued to grow and advance and the game is growing and advancing. And, you know, they there's there's cities and there's, you know, people that want WNBA teams like there's an expansion coming and there's people fighting for the opportunity to have a team in their city. And I think that is so awesome because when I came into the league, there was 16 teams in the league. Um, And I think it went down to like 13 by the time that I was, you know, uh, kind of retiring from the WNBA. And so to see that the game, which, you know, it was kind of like at that point, like, Still, the NBA is very much, you know, footing the bill and they're keeping this league alive and so on and so forth. And is it ever going to be able to 
sustain itself, make money, all of these things. I think that, you know, we're kind of past that point and it's growing. And then you have a great crop of college players that are coming in like generational players that, you know, and I feel like every, every, you know, couple of years, there's a player like Graham Stewart, like there's players that you're like, wow, like look what she's doing in college. And then Caitlin Clark comes along and it's just, there's, there's so many talented young women that are kind of, you know, picking up that torch and carrying it and like climbing the mountain much higher than we did. Katie Christensen joining us. All right. So to follow that up, then I'm going to ask you to do that, which you love so much, which is make a decision, but this is just a hypothetical. Katie's not big on making decisions. Here's the deal. Oh. Caitlin Clark, she'd go pro. She stayed Iowa. All right. We were looking. Can we talk about the big three thing last week? No, we're going to do it again. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> oh, oh, no, oh. <laughs> no, we're not, Katie. <laughs> oh, okay. Just a second. I know your memory is not so great. Your memory isn't. So 12.3 million viewers less for uh, the Iowa LSU game. That's We talked about this earlier. That's more than any women's game ever, as Jason said. NBA Finals, World Series, all that stuff, right? The WNBA. Uh, and, and by the way, this isn't me crapping on the WNBA. This is just numbers. 728,000 viewers uh, on average per game for the WNBA finals, which was the obviously the highest rated WNBA games last year. We're in this weird thing that I've never seen before where the college game, which let's be honest, if you put, I don't care who, you could probably put South Carolina and Iowa and UConn and pick an all-star team from those three, and the Aces would probably paste them by 30. That's just how it works in any sport. They're pros. They're grown. I think we can all agree on that. But yeah. for some reason, the college game is lapping right now the WNBA game when it comes to ratings and, and, and revenue. So my question is this. Obviously, Caitlin is going to come in and provide a spark to the WNBA, but they've already got – star she's going to be a smaller fish in a big pond i think she'll still be a big fish if you're caitlin clark especially with the nil deals and where she's at and people are so invested in iowa and her and the college game do you stay for your senior year rather than go to a a team in indiana that has the number one pick for a reason and it's not because they're super good like what would you do i would uh, would probably say with the I, i don't know what kind of money she's making you know, NIL money. I know that probably more than what she would potentially make as a pro. But then again, it's it's so hard to determine because she obviously has all the facts. We're we're looking at yeah. it from you know a distance, and I don't know what she made NIL money. I don't. You know, she she's definitely going to make money off of endorsements. Yeah. It's going to be more yeah. in the WNBA than it is in you know that you know it, it doesn't. It's it's going to continue. It's, she's going to have the ability to make more money in the WNBA off of endorsements than the NIL. Um, and so it's hard to say for, for that reason. Like, I don't know what the figures are, but I would just literally do the math. Like, Hey, Nike's going to sign me for X amount of money. I've been making X amount of money. Do I stay another year or do I go? It would purely to me be based off of financials. Um, because when it comes to salary in the WNBA, yeah, but then you also have to look at it from the perspective of she's probably going to go overseas and immediately play after her first year in the WNBA. So it's going to go, it's going to go NCAA, WNBA immediately into overseas, and there's going to be overlap. There's not going to be time off in between. She's also going to make a ton of money overseas. I mean, we're talking about the top players. In, in the W that will go over and make, you know, five times what they're making in the, in the WNBA overseas. So for that reason, you know, if she comes out, it's not a basketball thing. It's a, I think it's a business decision, right? Yeah. And she literally, you're right. I forgot about that, Katie, because the draft is, I think it's just in a few weeks. Right. The championship could be this weekend. And then the season's in May. Like she has no downtime at all, at least in the men's side championship ends or whenever the season ends for a college side, Draft is in June. You know, you got the summer and then the NBA regular season is in October. She's going to go. She'll have zero break. No, I mean, there's there's zero. You immediately go into it. She'll immediately go to the combine. I don't know if she's she, I, I don't know the facts, but I think it would be insanity if she participated in the combine. Yeah. Like I was a player that needed the combine to even have eyes on me and hopefully get drafted. Like, and it. by the way, like it took my college coaches doing a ton, a ton of you know, talking and, and networking with people to even get me an invite to the combine. Like 
if I hadn't gone, I would never have, have you know, been drafted. How'd you do? So they, how'd you, I'm just curious. Like, how, how did, did you well. do in that type of thing? I did. I did well. Yes, I what, did well. What was your 40 time? <laughs> yeah, Dave. It's faster than mine. I'm just asking if you remember. We don't run 40s in. Oh, really? <laughs> No. What was it? What did you? What did you press? We have a bench press. No, we don't do weightlifting competitions. This is not. It's oh, not the same. Okay. You literally go. You play games. It's skills competitions. It's it's just an opportunity for all the coaches to be in one place, and they get to work with you. Like they get to work with you. They get to see how you respond to coaching. They get to see attitude, mentality, like all these things that you know you you don't especially for players like me that they didn't know me from Adam. Right. So, you know, it's just, it, it's, it's not, not the same as the NBA. And I don't know, it's, it's not, it's been years since I was there, but I have a feeling that they're probably not having a bench pressing, you know, oh, you know, place at the, at the combine for the women, Shuttle drills. because we all know how, how valuable that is. I mean, I remember Kevin Durant going to the combine and everyone would be like, he can only bench press, you know, X amount of weight. Like, He's so weak. He, it's not going to work. Well, we obviously see that that was not the case. Wait a minute. Right? What about the jumpy thing where you have to jump up and slap the vertical? vertical? The vertical. Do they do that? The yeah, we do do vertical. So, you, so you, you did participate in that? In the jumpy thing. Did they? Uh, in the, yeah, I'm pretty sure. I mean, again, this was so long ago. I got gotcha, you. I, I got gotcha. you. I think I did do the jumpy Are we thing. Talking, medical. You yeah. go through medical. You go through interviews. You go through all that. So did you? Did they do a thing where like they put the white pages in front of you? You got over that, but then the yellow pages. Yeah, you, 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 like how'd they do that? Were you able to? Did you have yellow pages hops? What are we talking here? Dave, I, I know that I'm old now. I, I didn't I, say I that. Jason that, said that. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I'm just carrying on the you know the the line we're going down here yeah. um i i actually was fairly athletic and could jump i was an undersized spinner and power forward like i, I, it. I had i had i could jump i, I wasn't it. you know i wasn't nothing so I didn't say who said that to, who said that into the WNBA. you're a pro player who said that i just wanted to see what kind of hops you had you're putting words in my mouth i'm gonna get letters good <laughs> uh last thing before we go i said i had coaching questions uh we'll finish with this uh we talked about Lindsay harding congratulations to her uh news came out that steve clifford uh just a couple of years after he took the uh, charlotte job is going to step down at the end of the year he's going to angle for a front office role sounds like it's going to be a lot like the alvin gentry move with the kings uh and the first there was a list of like four candidates the first candidate mentioned was jordy fernandez and i think you know jason and i are in lockstep here i think with most kings fans like Please don't go. Also, we completely understand that at some point you have to go, but just Jordy's meaning to this team, if you will. Yeah, it kind of kind of reminds me a little bit of like, you know, the girl that maybe doesn't get asked to prom, but then she goes to prom and she's gorgeous and everyone's falling all over themselves. They're like, what did we do? Right. Like Jordy Fernandez to me is like one of those coaches that, people close to him know how fantastic he is. And obviously last year, it, the secret's out. Like he has a ton of respect in Canada, national team coach and he interviews for multiple jobs. Like I don't want to see Jordy go from a selfish right. standpoint, yep. but like he is going to get a head coaching job. And it's, it's one of those things where, you know, you're happy for him. You're happy for his young family and his story and how he got into the NBA is just so fascinating. And it's so tied to Mike Brown. I mean, Mike Brown found him to work out his son, you know, when he was in Cleveland. And uh, I don't know if a lot of the listeners know the story, but he brought him in one day because, you know, he was working out his son at the facility and there was a player that came in that wanted to get a workout in and they didn't have any coaches there at the time. So he said, Hey, Jordy, can you work this guy out? And he's down on the floor working out an NBA player. And I believe it was the owner that came in and was like, who's that guy. Right. Uh -huh. And that's how he got into the league. It's just the most random story, but you never know how you're going to get your first opportunity. And you fast forward to now. And, you know, he's got tons of experience in the NBA aside from, you know, being on Mike Brown's staff. Now he's got the national team experience and he's highly, highly respected. And I think that I would be shocked that if he didn't get an opportunity this year, we can cross our fingers from a selfish standpoint that he, he, he will still be on the staff. But 
you know, you got to you got to wish him the best because he is so, so deserving. That is Kings TV analyst Katie Christensen on her way for the last road trip of the year. They yes. fly out in uh, just under a couple of hours. And Katie, uh, I believe it's a uh, it's one of those front row, second row season ticket holder events at Madison Square Garden. I, I believe the Kings are flying a bunch of folks out, including our general manager. So if uh, I know in the past you've had duties there, I don't know if you do or not where it's a. I I don't know. You know. I know that we're not calling the game. That's as far as I've gotten. Gotcha. Well, so you just so you just get to hang out at MSG. I guess so. I mean, I haven't really gotten the details yet. When we were in Phoenix, I chose to. Stay to home. go to Marley's and just watch the game from there. But well, now I you're in your old stomping grounds. Go to Brooklyn. Yeah, no, hang I out. think I'll, I'll probably hang out and, and go to the game. And, gotcha. You know, who, who wouldn't want to go to a game at Madison Square Garden? All right, no Joe Rogan comments. That's an inside joke. We'll take a break. Katie, appreciate you. Love you. Talk to you soon. Have a safe flight. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye. Bye. We'll take a break when we come back. <laughs> 